Thank you. And, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're prepared because I have actually the boring part of this segment, uh, regulatory compliance. But um, hopefully I want to try and give a, a view on this from more of the enforcement perspective, which is where I understand many of the questions really are seeming to be um, focused on now. We've heard a lot about the sulfur regulations taking effect at the end of the year. There's really not much more to say about that. But during a recent stock-taking symposium at IMO in 20. 20 at the uh, International Maritime Organization, the Secretary General of the IMO urged collaboration will be the key to success of this new standard. In our view, this collaboration is essential to achieve the expected environmental and respiratory health benefits associated with the global switch to the use of 0.5% fuels. And this can only be accomplished by all stakeholders working together towards a fair and consistent enforcement of the fuel oil sulfur requirements. Now, the Marshall Islands is a party to MARPOL Annex 6. We oversee compliance of a large and a diverse ship registry. So accordingly, the focus on the subject, from my point of view, will be from the interests of a flag administration, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to elaborate on this particular view. The first point I want to highlight is, is really an important view on enforcement from, from our standpoint. Um, it should be noted that the obligations on all parties to MARPOL Annex 6, both port states and flag states alike, with respect to enforcement or con and control, are already governed under Chapter 2 of MARPOL Annex 6. The survey certification and control frameworks have been in place for some time, actually since the inception of the convention. So these compliance mechanisms are not new and do not change consequential to the shift from 3.5% to 0.5% fuels at the end of the year. The only change at the end of the year, essentially, is the numerical limit for the sulfur content of the fuel oil, and that change essentially takes place overnight. But despite the simplest depiction, the magnitude of the change on a global scale should not be underestimated. It's unprecedented and will profoundly affect industry. We recognize this. Most of this is a bit of an old story at this point, despite some lingering uncertainties. But regardless, our view on this is that ships must be compliant on and after this date. So the transition period is taking place now, and compliance is required on the 1st of January. From the flag state point of view, compliance is documented and verified according to the current statutory survey and certification requirements under regulations uh, 5 and 6. In the case of the Marshall Islands, the issuance of the International Air Pollution Prevention cert Certification has been delegated to recognized organizations to carry out this work on our behalf and is carried out under the Harmonized Survey Certification Schedules. So there's really no special provisions that have been established in this regard. Similarly, the role of port state control is also fully addressed under the same chapter, under the same existing regulatory framework. Although PSC activities continue to evolve beyond the normal document check and include more indicative methods such as spot checks of fuel oil in use or uh, sniffing or sampling of the exhaust from, from the ship's funnel, guidelines on operational control are adjusting in line with these enhanced approaches. But again, the regulatory frameworks remain unchanged. So the main point to highlight here is that while port state control rights for verifying operational requirements are already governed under Articles 5 and 6 of the main MARPOL Convention, as well as Regulations 10 and 11 of Annex 6, Article 6 of the MARPOL Convention specifically calls for all parties to cooperate in the enforcement of the provisions of the present convention. So that includes all annexes, including MARPOL Annex 6. It's on this key and underpinning provision that we see this collaboration among stakeholders to be essential. And this is the collaboration that the Secretary General was referring to. Taking into account the anticipated variety of potentially complicated and difficult compliance issues in the future. The sulfur content standard itself is simplistic, but in the real world, achieving compliance has to take into account a range of interrelated variables, some of which are beyond the scope of control of the ship. Therefore, we as a flag administration are open to work in partnership with other enforcement agencies to find pragmatic and consistent solutions on these instances. From the Marshall Islands Registry, our key policy instrument giving effect to air emissions obligations are located under uh, a policy document titled Marine Notice 2-013-8. 
This can be found on our website or it's also available from any of our representative offices. The administrator's been quite busy recently developing updates to this policy to incorporate recent outcomes from the IMO. Over the last two years, the IMO has been undertaking work on developing guidance and further measures to help enhance consistent implementation of the standard, taking into account the costs associated with this change. One noteworthy inclusion into this policy is a reference to the ship implementation planning guidelines. Shortly after its publication last year, the administrator issued these guidelines to a marine safety advisory to ensure ship owners had early access to this information. It's now been incorporated by reference directly into the updated policy, with a, a caveat noting that this ship implementation plan, which is um, standardized under these guidelines, is a non-mandatory document, but it is recommended to be on board, to be used as a tool in the event of difficulties or issues when converting and transitioning into the use of 0.5% fuels. Additionally, the policy is also brought up to date in advance of the forthcoming amendments to Regulation 14. This is with respect to the future amendments that will establish a prohibition against the carriage of non-compliant fuel on or after the 1st of March, 2020. This fundamental change to Regulation 14, even though it takes place after the 1st of January, 2020, we would like to highlight and note, does not infect the current enforcement provisions. So enforcement is still required on and after the 1st of January. Another important note from a national perspective is to now require ship owners and operators to report to the administration instances where fuel oil delivered is found not in compliance with the flashpoint limit required by SOLAS. The specific reporting requirement is in line with the recommendations issued by the Maritime Safety Committee earlier this year relative to discussions on safety aspects relating to the use of oil fuel. And then lastly, and perhaps most significantly, um, we've also produced a new form for communicating uh, fuel oil non-availability reports, or FONARs, according to the standard format agreed at the last session of the MEPC. The standard format for the FONAR is one of the very positive outcomes of the consistent implementation guidelines, from our point of view, since it represents a step forward from the existing provisions of Regulation 18 that are already in place and address fuel oil availability. So again, this is a situation where the framework for addressing fuel oil availability is already available within the convention framework, but what was lacking was a standardized approach or a consistent approach towards reporting that information. So by having a standardized template for the FONAR, the intention is to facilitate better coordination between parties at a convention when considering appropriate actions to take in such scenarios. The Marshall Islands form is actually based on a format appended to the consistent implementation guidelines and was developed specifically intended to provide user friendliness using a model that we had actually proposed to a submission to the IMO in collaboration with Canada and Australia. In our view, usability will be essential towards providing consistency in how information is obtained and reported and subsequently notified to the IMO by uploading to the IMO notification platform. As you may be aware, Marshall Islands has actively collaborated with several other member states and industry organizations calling for enhanced reporting of information on the implementation of the 0.5% standard. A clear standardized form for use in non-availability scenarios should hopefully support this aim, since what we're looking for or calling for is clear information on where the difficulties are arising with respect to implementation as well as use of 0.5% fuels. Our work doesn't stop here, of course, and um, we've actually been very busy over the last uh, year or so raising awareness of some of the ongoing issues associated with this monumental regulatory change. IMO 2020 has been a regular key topic of discussion within recent meetings of the Marshall Islands Quality Council. This is an association of various industry stakeholders, not just ship owners, that meet periodically to provide the maritime administrator with feedback on topical issues of importance. In addition to updating and publishing national policies, directing compliance as, as expeditiously as possible, such as our marine notice, the administrator representatives and offices around the world have also been actively engaging in outreach and face-to-face -face meetings with ship owners and managers to try and address advice of developments and answer any questions relating to our expectations for compliance. Also, we've been looking within, ensuring administrator representatives in our offices that will be on the front lines are also appropriately trained and informed of these requirements and associated issues. 
This is so that we may collectively as an organization appropriately respond and assist when needed, as well as to be able to collaborate and interact with other um, enforcement agencies around the world. Last, we can't forget our industry partners as well, who've also been working very hard developing a range of supporting guidance materials in anticipation of some of these challenges. Accordingly, we also encourage all stakeholders to make use of these very valuable resources available and to be prepared and to be prepared for the end of the transition, which is actually on our doorstep. So for the sake of expediency and answering questions, I've ended this early and turned it over to the next speaker. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much.